All right, Acts 26. Verse 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Oh, happy day that would be. Somebody that would actually ask you what you believed, or if they asked you if you were saved, wouldn't that just throw you down on the floor for a minute? Then Paul stretched forth his hand and answered him for himself. He said, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before the touching all the things whereof I'm accused of the Jews. So you're coming into a chapter where he's going to talk to Agrippa about you've got a group of Jews that are really getting down on Paul because of the, the motivation of the devil. And the motivation of the devil comes from Acts uh, 20. Uh, look back at Acts 20. Hold on to Acts 26. Now, <clears throat> the devil has always been against Paul from his separation in Acts 13. But now he's really going to go after him because what Paul is going to reveal is going to be universal. It's not going to be just uh, those that first trusted Christ. Look at Acts 20, uh, 22. And now I go, now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. <clears throat> he is ready to go, and the devil is coming as hard as he can. Thus, and go back to Acts 26, they've been persecuting him and chasing him, and I think people are chasing him with vows on them and everything else. <clears throat> and when he gets to Acts 26, when we get to Acts 26, Paul is happy that he can tell the king. Now, there's a reason for this. Hold here. Go to Acts chapter uh, 8. and uh, 9, I apologize. Acts chapter 9, verse 415. Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said unto him, uh, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel. This is Ananias. He's, he's telling Ananias why he's going to see this man, Saul, who's a dangerous man at that time. They don't know that he's had a hearing of the Lord and has a conversion. Um, he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Go back to Acts 26. King Agrippa. Here's one of the kings. All right. Caesar. He's going he's gonna to talk to some kings. It's told there. It's prophesied to him. This is what's going to happen. So now he's before King Agrippa, and he's going to tell him, he's going to tell him some truths, all right? Now look in verse 3, Acts 26, 3, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, known to all Jews. Uh, know all Jew, all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, that if I, if they would testify that they, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. All right. So now, King Agrippa, I'm a Pharisee. You understand this, okay? And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God under our fathers. And if anybody should have known anything. It should have been the Pharisees. Why? John said, search the scriptures for him. And then you think you have eternal life. And there they testify of me. They, they always were looking at the scripture. They were always announcing things and putting things into effect, traditional wise, whatever else. A Pharisee should know what the scripture says and should know the promises. But now watch. Now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our 12 tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Paul witness after his uh, the Lord's appearing to him is the fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. 
That means that the promise of him sitting on the throne, which is the same statement that Peter says in Acts chapter 2, because it wasn't possible for death to hold the Lord, because the promise is that he would sit on the throne of David. If, G if Paul is preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then he's confirming the promise will be coming about. But there's something that the devil's chasing him hard for in this chapter. Now let's roll on. He said, uh, verse uh, seven, under which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? They don't want to hear that Jesus is raised from the dead. Obviously, if they were to believe he was raised from the dead, they would know what they did. That's Acts 2 preaching, okay? Verse 8. Why should it be thought of uh, a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He did not believe, as Saul of Tarsus, he did not believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Because if he believes he's raised from the dead, he's got to know who he is, and he does not believe he is the Son of God. All right, now, <clears throat> verse 10 which thing I also I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly mad against them. And you understand, the devil knows that if he can get a believer of the church established in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5 to blaspheme. He's ruined them. Why? Well, doctrinal. Matthew 12. He, he knows that if they'll blaspheme against the Holy Ghost they have, they're ruined. Okay? And Paul's his instrument. Saul is his instrument to get them. He's compelling them to blaspheme. In other words, go against what the Holy Ghost wants them to do. And obviously the Holy Ghost wants them separate, to stay separate and not conformed to the things of the, of the untoward generation. See, they were baptized, saving themselves from the untoward generation. And you can read that in Acts chapter two, uh, when they got baptized, they were saving themselves from the untoward generation because obviously the untoward generation would not get baptized. Uh, Mark 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. <clears throat> he that believeth not shall not shall be damned. <clears throat> a man that don't believe not going to go get baptized. And I'm talking about believing in the name of Jesus Christ. All right. He said, I compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them, even under strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus, with authority and commission from the chief priest. Verse 13, now here's the testimony of Paul that he's giving to Agrippa. At midday, O king, I saw in a way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, and, uh, I, and he said, I am Jesus and I persecute. He just witnessed the resurrection to King Agrippa. Are you with me? Okay. Verse 16, but rise, stand upon thy feet, for I've appeared unto thee for this purpose, <clears throat> to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea, 
and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Okay. He's happy to tell a grip of this. Now I want to I want to look at some things. Paul's purpose in life is to number one, witness the fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, being that he's the son of God. Second purpose, to preach the gospel when he separated in Acts 13. Why? The gospel is based on Acts 13. Uh, we'll go back to Acts 13 and watch. In Acts 13, it doesn't state it like it does in, for, uh, you know, God doesn't leave it a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It's obvious the way the words are, there's the gospel of Christ. But look in Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Well, the forgiveness of sins is part of the gospel <clears throat> in the fact that he was raised from the dead. And verse 39, and by him all the believers justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, 24, which it is, the chapters about Abraham and believing, having imputed to him for righteousness or accounted to him, uh, account, accounted, it, it was counted unto him for righteousness. All right, verse 24, Romans 4, 24. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Remember, the first thing that Paul's going to witness is Jesus raised from the dead. That makes him the son of God. Then he's going to tell what the son of God did. All right, now watch verse 25, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Verse one, chapter five, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is going to witness the peace, the peace with God. Turn away to Romans 10 and watch. In Romans chapter 10, Nothing like being called to do something and then being allowed to do it. I think about <clears throat> uh, what Paul said in Romans 11 when Elias went out and it appeared that nobody wanted to be converted with his message and he, he was a little bit scared. And he said, Lord, they kill thy prophets and dig down an altars and I'm left alone. They seek after me. And the Lord come back with him and said, uh, and, and I'm just saying this, the, the way I, you know, I'm just, oh, I'll just read it. Verse uh, four, uh, five, four. But what say the answer of God and him? This is Romans 11, by the way. I've reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then at this present time, also there's a remnant according to election of grace. Back then, God knew who he was sending Elias to. Elias didn't know, Okay. Things weren't working out the way he thought they was. But they'll work out the way God wants them to. Here's Paul. Then he brings up to his time that the reason he goes to a Jew first is there's a remnant of Jews that are, number one, going to believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Number two, they're going to see the justification by the delivery and the resurrection of Jesus Christ by the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to scripture, was buried, and rose again the third day according to scripture. In that, he died for your sins, then your sins are paid for. He arose for your justification, okay? So I go back to Romans 10 and watch, verse 9. Now, let's go back, verse 8. What saith it? Now, this is the righteousness which is of faith, of verse 6. The Bible says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. Uh, I went to a funeral yesterday that was the most iniquitous funeral of a grace believer I ever saw. Uh, there were seven masons that did their aprons. And the man that did the service was not a preacher. He was a doctor, a medical doctor, and read out of an NIV. And I had enough. And I walked across the cemetery in front of everybody, sat down on my Harley. They wouldn't allow me to preach it. I sat down on my Harley and watched those silly masons do their thing. 
And as soon as it was over, I started my Harley up, beeped the horn once for my friend that was buried, shook the dust off my feet and drove off. That family denied a final testimony of that man that died. A final testimony. You see, when you die, you can get one more testimony in by letting somebody tell the gospel and tell the people that are alive there what Jesus Christ did. That didn't happen yesterday. And it made me sick because I've known the man 30 years. It made me sick to my stomach, made me feel like what's the use of preaching to people that supposedly say they believe when they won't do nothing about it. Man, make a stand, folks. Stand for what you believe. It may hurt. It will hurt. It's hurting Paul. He's in, he's in uh, captured right now in front of Pilate. He's fixing to go to Rome in jail. He's fixing to die in jail. What for? Because he's doing the witness. He's doing the work he was called to do, and he was happy about it. Aren't you? Are you happy? Are you happy that you could might get in a situation and be able to testify the grace of God? Happy that somebody might hear your testimony of salvation by the gospel of Christ? Are you just not standing? That's the problem with a lot of people. Well, it will happen yesterday. I can guarantee you that because I've seen it and I had to get out of there. Uh, Romans 8, uh, Romans 10, 8. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not uh, be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all them that call on him. For whosoever shall call upon them, the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. When people left that funeral yesterday, they had no more knowledge than they did when they walked up. They didn't know anything any more than they did. That is a horrible shame. At least they could have left mad. No, they weren't mad. It was just another funeral. That's really, it really hurts, folks. I've been teaching for a long time. And my harsh prayer is always that number one, people get saved. Number two, that they have peace. And number three, that they're willing to stand for what they believe, no matter what it costs them. I can't do anything about it, but I can preach. Well, we're reading about a man who went through a, 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 a lot of things, and he was happy. There he stands before uh, the king and does not deny telling him the truth, uh, the, the gospel of peace, on and on. Now, turn to Proverbs chapter 3. It's one thing to say you believe. It's another thing to trust what you believe. That's... Ephesians 1, 12, 13, and 14, and to trust the Lord to take care of you while you believe. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not thine own understanding. See, Paul said, but now in this present time also there's a remnant according to election, election of grace. Uh, Paul is called to do a ministry, yet he's stoned, he's jailed, he's... Uh, I mean, all kinds, he's even put to death by stoning, and then he's in his later ministry, he's in prison. I mean, if anybody would have thought, if had the right to think that his ministry was failing, it was Paul. Yet he knew it wasn't. And he confers the fact on, he confirms the fact on in the Philippians that it's not only given half to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. The things that I've seen and heard of me do, and he said uh, uh, the suffering that comes is because of following Paul. Now why? He said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Sometimes people get sick because of that verse. 
they haven't taken heed to it. Uh, what will be help to thy neighbor? Departing from evil, fearing the Lord. I mean, God ain't changed his mind. Now, I understand we're going to get persecuted. We're a sheep for the slaughter. But sometimes things come on people because they don't depart from evil. They, I, I don't want to go into it anymore. I, I'm just, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to talk about some other things right now. I may get into that later. He said, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thy increase. So, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth as a father, the son in whom he delighted. Now, wait a minute, verse 13, in the context, happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. All right, now let's deal a little bit with this. Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians three. Ephesians chapter three, look with me in verse one. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. If they've heard it, now they're reading it. That, that's what's so amazing about it. the Ephesians were idol worshiping aliens, worshiping Diana and other gods and all that. And yet God sent people to them to preach to them. And then he took Paul, who's in prison, inspired him to write a letter to them. And in writing this letter, he confirms that the dispensation of grace was given to them. Isn't that amazing? Verse three, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote it for a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That book is a revelation, and it's to let you know Paul's knowledge of what he understands in the mystery of Christ. Now, that's incredible when you think about it. The mystery that Christ died was the gospel. That's the gospel of Christ. That was a mystery. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Hold on, Ephesians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. This is what, when the gospel was revealed to Paul, what he got. Verse 5, 1 Corinthians 2, 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. God wants your faith to be in his power, not your faith. Okay? Your faith's involved. That's Galatians 2, 16. You believe in Jesus Christ. But you wouldn't believe in Jesus Christ if somebody didn't tell you who he was. And Galatians is very clear on that, he, that, I, that he might reveal Christ in me. I preach to the heathen. Okay, but now watch that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, now, you just get a hold before the world, God ordained your glory. He established what he was going to do to give you glory of Romans 8, 28, 29, 30. And one day, he took a Pharisee who was an evil Pharisee mean Pharisee, persecuting an injurious Pharisee, and appeared to him, separated him, called him with a holy calling. That is incredible. And that man wrote us 13 letters. Your stand number one, should be that Jesus Christ, Son of God. Number two, that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Number three, that Paul is your apostle. Number four, 
that the scriptures are inspired. They're the King James Bible. When a man stood in front of me yesterday reading out of another Bible, he's lying. And he's not inspired of God. And he left the people out there wondering what God truly said. Yes, I got my gut full of it. I don't like that kind of thing. I like it to be presented. And I've longed for it for years to go to a funeral where it was actually presented. And if it ain't a grace ministry, it ain't going to be presented. It's just going to be the same old stuff going on and on and on, leaving people blind and in the dark. Folks, it is not our job as the body of Christ to leave people in the dark. If we follow Paul, they will be shown, turned from darkness to light. And that's what Paul's told Agrippa. But now, now watch. So there is a mystery there. Now go back to Ephesians chapter three and, and see verse four. Wherefore, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The mystery of the gospel of Christ is that he died for our sins. According to scripture, was buried and rose again the third day. The mystery that's in Christ is that the Gentiles, it's in verse six, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus by the gospel that was revealed by Paul. They finally one day, a day opened up and God let the Gentiles have the gospel, the power that he has of salvation, Romans 1. And Paul's not ashamed of the gospel. And now he's not ashamed of the revelation he got. And I'm not ashamed of it. I'm happy. I'm happy that this is in the scripture, that I don't have to worry about my salvation. I don't have to go find my salvation. I asked a boy today uh, at a shop I was at, I said, uh, are you a sinner? And he said, yes. I said, what are you going to do about it? And you would not believe the expression on his face. And then very quickly, he said, I don't know. I said, well, if you uh, did according to the Old Testament, if you offer up a sacrifice today, they'll put you in jail. I said, so how are you going to claim? I said, you're just like the Israelites that were in Egypt. They couldn't offer up a sacrifice because the people around them wouldn't let them, the Egyptians, because they worshiped animals. We, in the dispensation of grace, can't work, uh, 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 can't uh, offer up righteousness, our righteousness, because we don't have any. We're not righteous. So what are we going to do about it? And he looked at me and he said, I don't know. And I said, one day, God let his son become you. He became sin. And when he did, he died. And when he died, he died for your sins. He was buried, and in hell, he took the punishment, the judgment, and then the third day, God forgave you and raised his son. I said, ain't that simple? And he looked at me like, holy crap. I never heard nothing like that before in my life. Isn't that a shame? In the world we live in, with the communications that we have, with the satellites and all the preaching and going on on TV and everything, and he don't hear that. Uh, it's kind of bad, ain't it? Well, it's the godless world blinding in the minds because if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the godless world blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Now go with me to Ephesians 4, and let me see if you're happy about this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Nobody showed them what Paul said. Are you happy you have? Think about it. Are you happy enough to suffer in happiness? Curious question, ain't it? All right, now watch. First Timothy chapter one. Now let's see what Paul says here. Remember, he said he was happy. First Timothy chapter one, verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. That sounds like a happy man. I thank him. I'm not happy about this. Who has enabled me for he counted me faithful, put him into the ministry. Okay. Revelation. 
everything Paul talks about was revealed to him. Turn to Galatians chapter one. In Galatians chapter one, verse 11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul had the revelation given to him and he was happy about it. He was, he was totally desirous to do what it was told to do. But now I want you to think about something. Let's go back in the Old Testament for a minute. Daniel chapter two. Back to the book of Daniel. Chapter two. Daniel two is about Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if there's anybody that shouldn't have been happy, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, their names were changed to Babylon because they've been taken into captivity because the times of the Gentiles began with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, look in verse one. And uh, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherein his spirit was troubled and his sleep uh, broke from him. Then the king commanded to all, call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king and the king said to them, I have dreamed a dream and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Sirach, O king, live forever. Tell the, thy servants a dream, and we will show the interpretation. Yeah, that'd be easy. Somebody tells you they had a dream, then you can make up anything you want because they don't know the answer anyway. But he's going to make it a little harder for them. Verse 5, then the king answered and said unto them, Chaldeans, the thing is gone for me. <clears throat> if you will not <clears throat> make on, I made known unto me the dream with the interpretation whereof, you should be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Whoa. Whoa. They got trouble. They got trouble. Not only do they have to tell the dream, they have to interpret it. And they ain't got that kind of power. Then uh, they answered again uh, and said, let the king tell us his service a dream and we will show the interpretation. King answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one degree for you and you have prepared for <clears throat> you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the times be till the time be changed Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can tell, uh, show me the interpretation thereof. They're, they're done. They're had. Because the, the dream came from the Lord, and they have no way of knowing it. Okay? The Chaldeans answered, behold, before the king and said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's manner. That's what God wanted. That's what God wanted him to say. That's not a man. But God has a man. And his name is Daniel. Just like God's got a man right now, Paul. There ain't nobody can figure out what the Lord did until he reveals it to Paul. Are you talking about the severity of not preaching Paul's letters and not committing to people that he is our apostle and that his gospel is the gospel of the uncircumcision different than Peter and on and on? I've tried for 40 years probably to discern this to people, to show them it is not a waste of time to deal with Paul's letters. It is not a waste of time to study. It is not a waste of time to fellowship because you need to make a stand more than ever anymore. Times have changed since I started preaching <clears throat> and, and people do not want to talk to you. Young people are not interested. So you may be coming to a time when there's just going to be one last grace believer somewhere and the body will leave. I know you think a lot about worldly things. 
but he told you to set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Why? Because your life is hid there, not here. Now watch. Uh, verse 11. <clears throat> it is a rare thing that a king required, uh, that the king required. And there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with a counsel wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said unto Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the known, a thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, which people call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Babylonian names. And <clears throat> they would uh, desire mercies of God of heaven concerning this secret. There it is, secret, secret, okay? That Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then, now just, just listen. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Hmm. Revealed. Turn to Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians 1, 12. Daniel got the revelation and bless God. Ephesians 1 12, that we should be the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trust after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until a redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Why should you be happy? Why should you praise God? You had his secret given to you. Turn to Amos, the book of Amos. That should take some of you a while. All right, in Amos <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Wow. The prophets wrote down things. That's what God did. He revealed his secret to the prophets to write down. He didn't give them the understanding of it. We know that by Peter. They didn't understand why Jesus should suffer. They were wondering why should the Messiah be cut off? Why should he suffer? Why should he die? And he was there at the Calvary. Why? If this is the son of God, if this is the Messiah, why is he dying? Peter didn't want him to die. He said, uh, I'll be delivered up, suffer from anything. Chief priest now to be crucified and rise again the third day. And Peter said, no, they didn't know. Paul's the man that knew. Paul's the man that had it revealed. An unworthy Pharisee, Benjamin who wasn't worthy of salvation in any form or matter, denied all the salvation message preached to him by Peter, and yet the Lord appeared to him and revealed his secret to him. Isn't that amazing? Now watch Proverbs 3 again. I apologize. I want to just hang on to this. In Proverbs 3, verse 32. For the fraud is abomination to the Lord. The fraud is abomination to the Lord. But his secret is with the righteous. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Check yourself. Why shouldn't you be happy? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right, made righteous, then turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, secret reveal. What is it? All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Turn to Romans 16. In Romans 16. Verse 25, now to him that is a power to establish you. How? With the preached word, the King James Bible, the inspiration. Able to, he's able to uh, establish you according to my gospel. The gospel's hid and it's revealed according to the scriptures, remember? And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to, now listen, the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Soothsayers, preachers, wise men, nobody can pull it out until God gives it to someone to reveal it. Now watch. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. It was revealed unto his prophets to write it down, but they didn't know what it meant. According to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. How was it made known? By Paul. Paul had it revealed to him. The thing that was revealed to him was the gospel of Christ. He said, I neither received it of man, neither was it taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation, correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Reckon why somebody wouldn't have wanted me to stand up yesterday and preach the gospel? Could it be that the God of this world don't want anybody to hear? There was over a hundred and something people there in that cemetery. Great time for somebody to hear. They didn't. They didn't hear it all. The God of this world blocked it. Say, Brother Jerry, are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. They block it all the time. All right, now watch. In <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. Now, I'm going to look at something else in just a second. Ephesians 2, 13. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. God got it to you. Turn, hold here, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And remember, said, how beautiful are the feet. Feet are on a person that's willing to go. That's one of the emphasis of Moses, brother, the burning bush, take your shoes off, hold the ground, okay? I don't want you walking over here with anything made by man. I made you, I want you to come over here and look. Now watch. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then as uh, workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Receiving the grace of God in vain is happening to a lot of people. It is they being subtly corrupted. They're being uh, taken away. Has nothing to do with salvation. If they trusted the Lord, they're saved, but they're being taken away killing the witness. The God's world's got to make the witness smaller because if the witness grows and it really does its job, the body's going to leave here. The body's going to leave. Say, well, why didn't God stop that? Because you can do whatever you want. You're in grace. You can trust the Lord or you don't have to trust the Lord. He won't kill you. You can do things. He doesn't kill you. You may have sickness, you have, may have bad health, you may have a lot of things happen to you. That's not for me to say. <clears throat> there are things that make God mad, though. And one of the things that make God mad is other gods. Iniquity, worshiping the wrong things, and you can correct it. That's the greatest thing about grace. If you get snared by the devil, you can recover from the snare. 
by the word of God. That's not going to happen in Hebrews. Uh, they fall away, they're done. The God of this world knew that. When Paul, before he was separated, remember, he was causing them to blaspheme. He was making them blaspheme, make them deny because they got afraid. Don't be afraid, be happy. Be happy that somewhere, sometime, God preached to you the Apostle Paul's message and you got understanding. You got the secret. You were made righteous. You were holy and without blame. He said in verse 2, uh, oh, 2 Corinthians 6 and 1, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I've heard thee in a time accepted in a day of salvation by succor thee. That he's helped. How did he help? He got a preacher to you. And somebody invites you. Got a preacher to you. Sometimes I think people are afraid to get people they know around me. They're afraid I'll offend them. Well, there's a chance of it. I'm not going to be mean to them. I'm not going to make fun of them. I'm going to preach the gospel. And if you don't want them to hear that, is that, if that's the reason, then there's a shame involved there. Whosoever is called on the Lord, shall not, uh, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul said. And if anybody was walking on eggshells, it was Paul. Because everywhere he went, he was bound. Uh, I mean, it said, bonds of affliction abide in him. He said, it's, the Lord said, everywhere you're going to go, they're coming at you. And he said, that don't move. Me. Why? Because he trusted in the Lord. He knew that he could do exceed above all he asked. Uh, I was talking to him about 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It's ordained they that preach the gospel should live with the gospel. Do you realize that in depth of that verse, and, I'm, and I know the context, I'm not going to take it out of context, but the in depthness of it is, Paul said, who separated me from my mother's womb. Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. How did he live? By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's ordained they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. The gospel, they wouldn't be ashamed of it, and they could live of it. I have lived to the gospel for over 40 years. I, I'm trying to figure out, say, 84, 94, 104, 114. Well, almost 40 years. Almost 40 years. 30-something years, for sure, I can say that legally. I've lived to the gospel. How did I do that? Because God saved me for a purpose. He didn't get nothing. I realize that. But when Paul said he was chief, I've never been mean and persecuting people for what they believed. I've never put them in jail or never tried to kill them as a lost man. So when he said chief, he, he's serious. He, he was seriously after them. He was like an antichrist. And yet God saved him and he's a pattern. And I look at him and I know that I'm saved because if God saved Paul, he saved me. And I also know if he sealed Paul, and he did, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, I'm sealed. And I know that nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's what my apostle wrote to me. So I take his writings, and I walk by them. And walking by them, I know that God's going to take care of Thus, I can trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not to my own understanding. I don't understand some things that happen to me in life. God does. I don't understand why I come in contact with certain people in life. God does. I don't understand why some people deny and some don't. God knows. I don't understand why people get mad at me and leave. I, don't, I believe the same thing I've always believed and preach the same thing I always have. Might be a little more in depth sometimes because I learn more, hopefully. But I trust the Lord. And to trust the Lord, I'm happy. I'm happy because I don't have to manufacture this. I don't have to manufacture his word. I don't have to find an apostle. I have one. I don't have to worry about dying or living. God take care of that. I don't have to worry about being righteous. I've been made righteous. 
I don't have to worry about whether he'll support me or not. He always does. I'm happy, but I'm really happy when I get to talk about it. And yesterday broke my heart. I didn't get to talk about it. And it would have been a perfect chance to preach. Well, why didn't God let me? God didn't stop me. And I was there. Somebody else did. And somebody else has to pay for that. Hey, you deny him, he'll deny you a reward. Hey, that's just the way it is. Don't never forget that, folks. Uh, so we're saved. First Corinthians 15, the gospel said, by which also you're saved. We're sealed, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. We're secure, Romans 8, 38 and 39. We're known, Romans 8, 9. Then how happy are you? Are you walking around with that, oh, woe is me? Or are you afraid to talk to somebody? Are you afraid it's going to cost you something? It won't cost you nothing. You'll have an eternal reward somewhere, somehow. Trust in the Lord. Believe that God is able to do exceedingly above, abundantly above all that you ask or think. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer, with supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. And thanksgiving should make you happy. Amen.